Oh, hello. I'm Ian Bloomer, and I'm uh, happy you can join us today. Um, I was asked to participate in this, and I'm thrilled to be able to do that. So for those of you that uh, don't know me, I'm a diabetes specialist, and I work up in uh, Toronto in Canada. And I've had the pleasure of speaking to many diabetes uh, groups and organizations and individuals over the years. It's always a pleasure to do that. So one of the things I've discovered in my travels in the diabetes world, and in particular speaking to patients, is that, in my opinion, most people with diabetes are shortchanged when they go to see a physician for a diabetes visit, or for that matter, when they're meeting with diabetes educators, a nurse educator, or a dietitian, and so forth. And I don't think that enough positive comes out of most visits with a diabetes physician or a diabetes educator, with a family doctor. And I keep looking at why there is this problem. Why is it that people leave a visit with a healthcare provider not having gotten from it what should have happened? And I think, you know, it's a complex thing. There's a whole bunch of different reasons. But I think one key element is that people living with diabetes aren't sufficiently empowered to take charge of their health. And one component of that is not being sufficiently prepared when you go to see your physician. So what we're going to do, what I'd like to do here, is concentrate on things you can do as a person living with diabetes in advance of your appointment with your family doctor or general practitioner or for that matter with your diabetes specialist. These are sort of basic tips you can follow that I think can be very impactful, very helpful, allow for a reduction in the frustration perhaps you experience at times, and also to assist with keeping you healthy. So if we're looking at how to prepare for a visit to your diabetes healthcare provider, I'm going to go through some things and then I'm looking forward to your questions. It's much more fun to make this interactive. And to be honest, it's kind of weird when I'm talking here to my computer and have no idea if there's anybody out there. So it'll be fun for me uh, and hopefully helpful for you folks if you provide questions afterwards. Um, what I'm going to do also is I'll let you know in advance that <laughs> I'm just checking the cheat notes there from Emily. Um, I'm going to let you know in advance that the things I'm going to talk about over the next little while are also covered in some written materials which are available for you to look at on the web. So if some of the things I say I say too quickly, I don't enunciate, or you miss them in some way, feel reassured that you'll be able to uh, look at this information on uh, uh, some documents, some PDFs and websites, which I'll share with you in a few minutes. All right, so let's look at, I, I've got my little cheat sheet here to make sure I don't forget any uh, key points. So um, if we look at the key things to get ready, if you're going to be seeing the, the physician. Well, let's start with questions. So I can't even begin to recall the number of times I've heard patients say to me that they, when they come to see me, or any other doctor for that matter, that they had questions, but it slipped their mind at the time. People are under stress when they see a physician. Heck, I'm a doctor. I'm under stress when I see my own doctor. So what I would recommend you do is in between the time you last saw your doctor and the next time you see your doctor, keep a list of questions running. And then take that list with you when you go to see your health care provider. And as the visit is unfolding, perhaps those things will spontaneously be addressed. But as the visit is concluding, if your questions haven't come up spontaneously during the conversation, pull out your list, look at it, and make a little set of tick marks to make sure that all your concerns were addressed. And if they weren't, bring them up at that point and make sure you get answers. You know, don't feel pressured. Please, do yourself a favor. Don't feel pressured just because you sense your health care provider is pressured because of time constraints. When you see your physician or your nurse or your dietitian, you're the boss, right? You're the customer. You're the one who it's all about. And so don't let yourself be shortchanged. Make sure that you bring up your questions if they haven't been addressed already and make sure you get answers. What you may find helpful is to write down the answers as you go along. 
or bring someone with you. Now, if you're there for a full physical, obviously you don't want to have your daughter there, if you're, especially if you're a man, as you're being interviewed about things like erectile dysfunction and you don't have a full physical. But for the question and answer part, bring in somebody else if you aren't confident that you're going to recall all the different answers that are going to be provided. Another thing I'd recommend you do, you have diabetes. Make diabetes is largely about, not all about, but largely about blood sugar levels. So make sure you, when you go in, you have your blood sugar record. Now, I'm a strong believer in the importance of keeping a written record of blood sugars, especially in advance of a visit to your healthcare provider. So I would encourage you to write down your readings. And also, as a backup, bring your meter with you. I read the interesting statistic that most people living with diabetes in North America have three meters. Well, perhaps they have three. One's in the sock drawer and one's in the car, one's at work, etc. But in any event, transcribe your readings into a single log and bring your meters with you, whatever meters you're using, just as a backup. If you want to make sure you're prepared and can present information to your healthcare provider that will maximally allow them to help you, there's a very specific way that's best to record your readings on paper or on a spreadsheet. If you go to my website, there's a PDF there you can download, and I think really that's the most useful format to use. And my website, I'm not sure if it's on the 2Diabetes website, so my website is ourdiabetes.com, O-U-R diabetes.com, ourdiabetes.com. And if you click on logbook, there's a spreadsheet you can download in PDF, and you can use that. I, I, most physicians and most people living with diabetes will find that format really good. So another thing, when you get to the office and you get in to see your doctor, it's very important if you live with diabetes, especially if it's longstanding, that your feet get checked you probably are aware that many people with diabetes are prone to foot problems. And foot problems can be minor or they can be serious. And you really need to make sure that your feet get examined properly. Sadly, diabetes is the leading cause of foot amputations in North America, except for amputations due to trauma. And most, not all, but most people who have foot problems, they can be looked after and amputations can be avoided. So what I'd encourage you to do is when you see your doctor and you get into the office, make sure your feet get checked at least once a year and if you have foot problems more often. So how can you be sure? And doctors, by the way, are notoriously bad at checking feet. Tends to get missed. So what I would encourage you to do is when you first get into the examination room, take off your shoes and your socks. And when your doctor comes in, they may spontaneously know to check your feet. But if that doesn't get done, say to your doctor, oh, by the way, I know how important a foot exam is. I've helped you out. I've taken off my shoes and, and, and my socks. Would you mind inspecting my feet and make sure that they look healthy and that there aren't any concerns there? The other thing that's important is to get your blood pressure checked. And the target blood pressure is no higher than 130 over 80. So when you get in to see your doctor, this may sound trite, and for those of you in very warm climates, maybe it doesn't matter, but it's more likely you're going to get your blood pressure checked if you're wearing a sleeve that can roll up easily. So if you're wearing a tight upper garment and it goes down to your, to your wrist and it's impossible to, get, to, to roll it up, it's more likely your blood pressure won't get checked. Or if it's checked, they'll be done over clothing which tends to be inaccurate. Sounds simple. I would recommend you make sure that you wear a shirt, a dress, or whatever it is that allows your arm to be easily accessed so that your doctor can check your blood pressure and also get an accurate measurement. Now, you probably already know that it's essential, if you have diabetes, that your cholesterol level be checked and be excellent and that your kidney function be checked and monitored and also made sure it's excellent and when necessary treatment is given. So what I see often happens, which I think is, is so unfortunate, is that someone goes to see their doctor and their doctor gives them a lab requisition at the end of the meeting and says, okay, on your way out, stop by the lab and get this done. I'll call you if there's a problem. 
Well, that's okay. I mean, that system isn't a terrible system, but it's much better, much more effective, and much more helpful to you if you get the requisition at the time of one visit for lab work to be done six months later before your next visit. And I tell all my patients to do that. I say, here's a requisition. I'm seeing you back in six months or three months, whenever it is. I said, get this done a couple of weeks before you come back so that when you come to see me, we have the lab results in front of both of us right there, and we can review it at the time. That will maximize the value of your visit. We'll avoid extra visits back, extra calls back from the office back and forth, telephone tag. I'm sure you know the whole, uh, the whole business. So ask your doctor for a requisition for lab work that needs to be done in advance of your next visit. What I also do, by the way, is on the lab requisitions I give patients, I have this, <laughs> I actually print it up. It's a stamp, and it's instruction to the lab to mail a copy of the results to the patient if they want it. You know, clearly if it's not something you, you would like to have in your own records, that's fine. But if it is, I would suggest you ask your doctor to ask the lab to have a copy of the results go to you. Don't be hesitant. I mean, it's your blood. It's your urine sample. Why shouldn't you be allowed to have a copy for your own records? I think that's important. And then you can also, uh, you can also review them. If you have diabetes, you're probably on a number of different medications. And it can be very confusing. I would strongly, strongly encourage you to always bring your medications with you in their original containers to every visit with your doctor, and certainly with your, when you're being seen by your specialist. And you might say, well, they're the same drugs I was on last time. I don't need to bring them in. But the thing is, often medications are taken incorrectly, or someone accidentally forgot to take a medication, or they started taking a medication they were supposed to stop. How important is this? Well, let's put it this way. There's two things. Number one, 50% of people I see, 50%, when they bring in their medications because I've twisted their arm and told them they really must do so, 50% of patients are taking either a different drug or a different dose or something different from what they thought they were doing, 50% of the time. And often the, the, the issue here is not minor. And I always think back of a patient that I saw a couple of years ago who had cancer. And he was sure he was on drug A in dose B. When I actually had him bring in the medication, he was on the wrong dose. His pharmacist had made a mistake. Everybody makes mistakes. I'm not blaming anybody. But his pharmacist had accidentally given him a dose that was only 10% of what he was supposed to be on. He could have died. His life was saved because I twisted his arm to bring in his medications. I looked at the actual bottle, and I was able to pick up that it was the wrong dose because the decimal was in the wrong place. So again, err on the side of safety. Bring your medications with you whenever you go to see your physician. I really think that that is incredibly important. Some people say to me that they feel shortchanged when they see a doctor because they feel pressure because of time constraints because they go to the office and the waiting room is full of 20 people. And most Family docs in the world, certainly in North America, have somewhere between five and 10 minutes per patient. But if you have diabetes, your care might be very complex. You might be on 10 different medications. You might have log books to review and feet to be examined and your blood pressure and your cholesterol and all that. So you want to make sure you don't get shortchanged in terms of time. Well, there's a few tricks. What I would encourage you to do when you're booking your appointment, your next appointment, book early. So as you're leaving appointment A, speak to the receptionist and book your next appointment. If you want to make sure that you're not the one waiting behind 20 other people, ask for the first appointment time in the morning when your doctor is first starting their day. Or the first appointment after lunch. And again, you're the first appointment, and therefore there will be time available or if you want, book the last appointment of the day. So it may mean they end up having to wait around longer because of the other people who are likely putting the doctor behind, or the doctor's disorganized and getting behind out of their own reason. But in any event, if you're the last patient of the day, 
then your doctor is going to feel less pressured because they don't have a waiting room full anymore and they're more likely to spend extra time with you that they would have liked to have spent but before, otherwise would have felt pressured. But now you're there by yourself with the doctor. And I think you're likely to find that more time is set aside for that. Now, when you see your doctor for your diabetes, do yourself a favor. And just like I said, see your doctor for your diabetes. You may have other health issues. You may have arthritis issues. You may have gynecological issues or prostate issues. You may have all sorts of other issues that need to be addressed. Try to save those for a different time. Try very hard when you see your doctor for a visit for your diabetes that you and your doctor are on the same page and it's looked at specifically as being a visit for your diabetes. And that would encompass blood sugars, blood pressure, cholesterol, eyes, feet, etc. You have to make sure your diabetes gets the attention it deserves, and it's more likely to get that if you look at your visit as being what we call a diabetes-focused visit. Now, what we've done is at the Canadian Diabetes Association, where I've been involved with dissemination of the clinical practice guidelines, in order to convey all this information in a way that's helpful, there's two things we, well, a whole bunch, but a few things we've done. One of which is we made a video. And the video is of a visit of a patient living with diabetes to a doctor for a diabetes-focused visit. And we made this video so that doctors can see what can be done, what should be done, and how to do so efficiently. And also so that people living with diabetes can see the entirety of what needs to be covered. Again, it should all be done. Your doctor should know what has to be done. But everybody's human. And if you work with your doctor and make sure these things are covered, all the better. So I have all the links to this information through my website. That might be one easy way to find out and watch the video. It's a good video. It's fun to watch, actually. Um, and again, my, video, my website is ourdiabetes.com. Alternatively, go to the Canadian Diabetes Association website, which is diabetes.ca. Follow the links for clinical practice guidelines, and then you'll, follow, you'll see submenus there with other links. Now, in addition to the video, um, oh, by the way, if you can't find it, email me uh, through my website. You'll find my contact information. If you can't find these links I'm referring to, just email me, and I'll, I'll point you in the right direction. So the paper, the, the PDF uh, documents that you should keep an eye out for, Hopefully you can see this. So this is a little tear-off sheet. It says your diabetes-focused visit. See what to expect. I know you can't read the submenus there, but that's okay. And how to prepare. Oop, that's all twisted and tilted, isn't it? Okay, how to prepare. There we go. How to prepare for your visit. So this is what the page looks like. Look for that on the diabetes website. Um, and again, the, the Canadian Diabetes Association website is diabetes.ca. My website is ourdiabetes, O-U-R-D-I-A-B-E-T-E-S, ourdiabetes.com. And if you can't find the information you want there, then just go to my website, follow the links to the contact information page, and then you can reach me that way. So that's the abbreviated form in terms of a list of what you need to do. The list of things that we want doctors, in particular primary care providers, to do shouldn't be hidden from you. You should be fully aware of what they need to know. But it's a much longer sheet, and again, I don't expect you to be able to read it. But on the web, you can find this on the websites I just mentioned to you. But it's a long, detailed sheet. It looks incredibly intimidating. Actually, it is incredibly intimidating. Anyhow, that's a list of things that we designed for primary care docs and specialists so that they know the key elements of what a diabetes-focused visit entails. And I was asked to repeat my email address. So uh, is there a website we can order the foot checker filament thing to check our sensitivity? Ah, OK. Uh, yes, yeah, so when you're having your feet examined, there's a few key things that your doctor needs to do. One is to look at your feet. Make sure the skin is healthy. There's no open sores or wounds or anything like that. But there's also something called a monofilament. It's a little piece of nylon. 
it's it's a firm little thing. Actually, you know, too bad I don't have one here with me. Um, I wonder if I have, give me one sec. Let me just look quickly in my drawer and see if I have one. No, sorry, I don't. But anyhow, it's a little nylon monofilament that's used to check for sensation in in the feet. And if you can feel it as the doctor is pressing this thing against your big toe, then that's a very good sign. It means you're at low risk for foot ulcers. But again, this doesn't have to be the exclusive purview of your physician or nurse or dietitian. You can get them yourself. And the American Diabetes Association, the last time I checked a few months ago, was providing these free of charge. It's called a 10-gram monofilament. So if you type into Google or whatever search engine you like, just type in monofilament American Diabetes Association order and see if you can get it that way. And if not, if you can't do that, go to my website, find my contact information, email me, and I'll try to find for you and send you the link with how you can get your own monofilament so you can test your own feet periodically. And again, if you can feel this plastic sensation on your foot, then that is a good sign, meaning that you're at low risk for damage to your feet. So that's my spiel. I think I've gone through my list. If you have any other questions, uh, please feel free to... Oh, I was asked to repeat my web address. All right. <laughs> I don't want to risk boring you all with saying it uh, too many times. But anyhow, so my website, again, is ourdiabetes.com, O-U-R-diabetes.com. All right. So Emily, feel free to forward to me any other questions. I'd be happy to um, address them. And as uh, so you're doing that, I'm just going to look through my little cheat sheet here and see if there's anything else I wanted to share with you. So the only... Th uh, uh, can Dr. Ian provide a website for people with diabetes with all the tests we should ask our GP for? Yes, um, I can. Well, in terms of diabetes, I can. Um, so again, what I've done is on my own website, I actually have a printout there. Again, it's a PDF you can download um, that lists all the tests that I feel should be done as part of your diabetes care and also how often they should be done. So that doesn't look at non-diabetes issues. You know, perhaps there's other health issues you have, whether it's PSA testing or so forth, that would be unrelated. But in terms of diabetes, if you, uh, if you visit uh, my site and print off that sheet there that lists which tests should be done and how often they should be done, and I think you'll find that helpful. Um, so one question is, could panic attacks be related to diabetes? Well, it depends. So panic attacks, in, in terms of the way it might be defined from a psychiatric standpoint, would not be related to diabetes. However, when people feel anxiety or panic or acute stress and their heart is pounding and they're shaky and sweaty and nervous, I'm sure that some of you recognize that that could be due to a low blood sugar because a low blood sugar causes adrenaline release. And adrenaline, as some of you know, is called the fight-or-flight hormone. So adrenaline causes people's heart to pound, and they cause them to shake and tremble. And it's, it's as if you drank 30 cups of coffee. So if you have low blood sugar, you'll have similar symptoms to what you might have if you have a panic attack. So if ever you feel that way, check your blood sugar and see if your blood sugar is low. And my trusty office manager who's eavesdropping on two diabetes, was kind enough, as I was chatting with you, to drop a monofilament on my desk. Thanks, Deb. So this is what a monofilament looks like. And it's actually going up my nose there. I'll put it over my forehead there. Uh, or maybe I'll try a white background. Let's see if that's better. There you go. So that's a monofilament. And this part here is the uh, nylon. So when you push that against your toe, as soon as it starts to bend like that, you should be recognizing that feeling. Okay, it's as soon as it's to that degree of tension. Let's pretend my finger is my big toe. You should be able to feel that. And actually, right here, it has the contact information to, uh, to track these down. So the website address is too long uh, to repeat. Um, but I'll give you their phone number. 
It's 301-594-4424. 301-594-4424. And it's called The LEAP, L-E-A-P, The LEAP Program. So if you don't remember anything I just said, just type in monofilament, American Diabetes Association order, and you'll come up with that. And if you missed all of that, email me and I'll send you this. Thanks, Deb. And here's a question. I recently had an insulin reaction at the gym and had a really hard time letting the nice concerns strangers around me know what to do to deal with this type of suggestion. Uh, okay, so the question is, um, how do we help people help us? And I think that's a really good question. So we are getting, not that it matters that much, we are getting a bit away from a diabetes-focused visit and preparing to see your doctor, but I'm happy to answer this anyhow. So how can you help people help you? So there are very good ways of treating low blood sugar, and there are lousy ways. So what I'd suggest you do is print off an information sheet from the American Diabetes Association or Canadian Diabetes Association websites about treating hypoglycemia. In general, you want to consume 15 grams of a fast-acting carbohydrate, whether it's milk or juice or, or pop or um, some people like the little rockets, little uh, candies we used to have as kids, but actually they're quite good treatment. Um, but there's a whole long list of things like that, and you consume that then you wait 15 minutes, check your blood again. If it's still low, then you uh, take another dose. But the thing is, as this uh, questioner is mentioning, is what to do if you can't look after yourself, if things are really bad. So someone could assist you by getting the appropriate thing. But let's look more specifically at what to do if your reaction is so bad that you can't look after yourself and you can't communicate if you're almost unconscious or very confused because that's a situation where bystanders often do the wrong thing. What someone should do if you're unconscious, hopefully it'll never happen, but it does happen to many people. If your blood sugar is so low, you can't look after yourself. If to the point that you're stuporous, semi-comatose, or right out of it, unconscious, people should not put things in your mouth. So let's say you're at home and the loved one finds, whether it's a sibling or a child uh, old enough to help you, or your, your spouse or a parent, if you're unconscious or nearly so, people should not try to help you out by putting anything in your mouth. Make sure they know that loud and clear. Because if you can't swallow properly if you're unconscious, you could choke, and that could be very dangerous. So what your loved ones have to know how to do is give you something called glucagon which you may have heard about, G-L-U-C-A-G-O-N, glucagon. Make sure if you are on insulin, or if you're not on insulin but on other diabetes medication that can make your blood sugar go very low, make sure that you have glucagon in your house, or if you're at work and you feel trusting of your workmates or other social settings, make sure that they know where the glucagon is and that if you have a reaction, typically it's an insulin reaction, most oral medications wouldn't do this, but some can, to the point that you're out of commission, right out of it, that they can inject this medicine into your leg and it'll raise your blood sugar. And that's only to be given to you if you're in a situation where it's not safe for you to take anything by mouth. It's called glucagon. It comes in what's called an emergency kit. If you're on insulin, ask your doctor for a prescription for it. If you're on oral medication like gliburide that you know from experience can make your blood sugar go very low, again, ask your doctor for a prescription for glucagon. Take your loved one, the person most likely to give it to you, take them with you when you pick it up at the pharmacy so that the pharmacist can show them how to do it. Because if they're not prepared in advance, when an emergency arises, people get nervous. That's human nature and they're not likely to feel comfortable giving this medicine to you. So take them with you. And the last thing I'll tell you about a glucagon emergency kit is they expire. It's typically about a year. So when you pick it up, check the expiration date and make a note on your calendar in advance of that expiration date 
so that you're reminded you need to get it replaced. And Emily is writing me a note, which I'm going to... Uh, I will, excuse me for a sec while I read this. I was reminded at a recent expo that diabetes is not just a blood sugar problem. Yeah, that's sure true. But often a cholesterol and blood pressure problem, we should focus more on those other numbers and have them in the normal range. Well, I think that's an important point. That we, when we talk about diabetes, we talk primarily about blood sugar. But I agree, we shouldn't talk exclusively about blood sugar. Everything else is important too because it all relates. Blood sugar issues are key in terms of preventing blindness, kidney failure, and damage to the nerve endings. But in terms of protecting you from heart disease and stroke and other health issues, it's not just about blood sugar. It's also about cholesterol, as this uh, individual noted, and blood pressure, amongst other factors. So yes, anytime you speak to your healthcare provider, all these things have to be looked at. And many people ask, and doctors even debate, they say, oh, what's more important, blood sugars or blood pressure? Is it cholesterol or blood sugars? I don't enter into that debate because it's all important. What's more important? The tire on the right side of your car or the tires on the left side of your car? I think they're both important. I wouldn't want to go without. So when you were talking about your diabetes, you want your blood sugars to be within target. In Canada, it's four to seven before meals, five to 10, two hours after meals, and you can look up the US targets at the ADA website, but it's the Canadian Times 18. In any event, and you wanna make sure your cholesterol is in target and your blood pressure should be under 130 over 80. So how do you know if you're in target? You check your blood sugar, write down your numbers, review those with your healthcare team. When you have your cholesterol checked, as I mentioned before, have the lab give you a printout or ask your doctor to give you a printout. Make sure your numbers are within target. If they're not, ask your healthcare provider what should be done to get them in target. When your doctor or nurse checks your blood pressure, whatever you do, don't let your healthcare provider just say to you, your blood pressure is fine. Ah, nothing to worry about. That's not good enough. If you're having your blood pressure checked, you need to know what the number is because you want to make sure that it's optimal for you. And an optimal blood pressure, as I say, is no higher than 130 over 80. So ask, it's your blood pressure, you're allowed to know the result. And if it's above that, like maybe you know from previous learning or from this webcast what your blood pressure should be, but maybe your healthcare provider doesn't. I can't be certain whether or not they would know. So if your blood pressure is above target, say to your healthcare provider, you want to work with them to optimize your blood pressure or cholesterol or sugars or whatever, and ask how you can work as a team to make sure everything is as it should be. I, you know, I, I've been a physician for over 30 years, and I can tell you that I have never been and never would be offended, never, if a patient says to me, I want to work with you, Dr. Bloomer, I'm your partner, what can I do to make things better? If you say that to your doctor, they will smile ear to ear because nothing makes a doctor happier knowing than knowing that they have someone with diabetes who wants to work with them to optimize their health. That is like best possible scenario for a doctor to have a person who's engaged in the process. Now, let's see, I thought there was another question here. Uh, no, I guess I'm mistaken. So, ah, but now Emily is writing, so perhaps there is. Uh, you're talking about heart rate. Um, well, I'm not sure if you can elaborate on that. So a normal heart rate is quite broad, anywhere from 60 up to more or less about 100. Um, there really aren't any direct issues for the great majority of people with diabetes in terms of heart rate. The only time that becomes an issue, and this is very rare, I'm talking about diabetes effects, not unrelated effects. But in terms of diabetes, there's a rare condition, fairly rare, called autonomic cardiac neuropathy or cardiac uh, uh, autoneuropathy. 
And that's a condition in which the nerve, there's nerves in the body that control heart rate. And sometimes those nerves can be damaged due to long-standing uncontrolled diabetes. And people can have a fast heartbeat. It's called tachycardia. And again, that's seldom. I've, in my entire practice of thousands of people, I think I've only got two patients that I can think of off the top of my head with that. And if you have a fast heartbeat due to cardiac neuropathy, then that can be controlled with medication. Sometimes we use a medication called a beta, B-E-T-A, throwing a lot of jargon at you, uh, with a beta blocker. Um, but that is a, is a rare condition and seldom, uh, seldom a, a problem. All right. And I, all right. So one question, and again, uh, talking about heart rate going very fast with exercise. Um, so what you can do, there, there's age-adjusted maximal heart rates to be achieved with exercise. Most exercise machines, um, actually I shouldn't say most, but a lot of exercise machines state this. Um, otherwise you can look it up on the internet and you can say target maximal heart rate for exercise. And whether you have diabetes or whether you do not have a, a diabetes, that target is the same. And it's not as if you shouldn't surpass that because you're going to die. It's not like that. It's just in terms of conditioning and so forth. That's the heart rate you should strive for. Um, but I can't be more specific than that because it's age-adjusted and you'd have to look up what your target heart rate is. What I can tell you is, in terms of concerns that you might have, that if you're exercising, your heartbeat's going to go dangerously fast, unless you have some underlying heart disease, that's simply not an issue. Um, now, one question, is there a protocol for diabetes that recommends blood pressure medication even if the blood pressure is normal because lowering it further protects your kidneys? Well, yes, there's a, a two-pronged answer to that. So number one, if you have diabetes, your target blood pressure, uh, geez, these Venetian blinds are making the face look kind of funny there. Um, if you have diabetes, your target blood pressure is lower than someone who doesn't have diabetes. So if you have diabetes, your target blood pressure is no higher than 130 over 80. If you don't have diabetes, your doctor may tell you it's okay to have a somewhat higher blood pressure. So number one, you may not have hypertension in the conventional sense, but if your blood pressure isn't optimal, then yes, it should be brought down to optimal levels through whatever means is necessary, whether that's salt restriction, exercise, or use of medication. So that's number one. But the second component of that is if you're at high risk for heart disease or stroke, then you should take what's called blood pressure medication even if your blood pressure is normal. Most people with diabetes, 80% 80, 80 of people with diabetes die from just one of two diseases. They die from heart attack or stroke. So although there's thousands of diseases out there, heart attack and stroke are the things that are most likely to kill you if you have diabetes. So you have to do everything humanly possible to reduce that risk. If you're at high risk of a heart attack or stroke, and again, most people, not all, but most people with diabetes are, then taking medication, certain medications can reduce that risk. And there's two types of drugs. One are called, group one is called ACE inhibitors or ARBs. ACE, A-C-E inhibitors or ARBs, ARB. Those medications came out years, decades ago, in fact, to control blood pressure. And they're still typically called blood pressure medication. But it's important to recognize, even if your blood pressure is normal, taking these medications can help protect your heart. So it's a bit of a misnomer to just look at them as being called blood pressure medication. And the second group of medications and that you should be taking if you have a high risk of heart disease or stroke are called statins, S-T-A-T-I-N-S. And statins are cholesterol medication, but even if your cholesterol is optimal anyways, if you're at high risk for a heart attack or stroke, taking cholesterol medication will reduce that risk. I'm just going to try changing the angle here so that I can try to get that zebra-looking appearance off my head here. But that didn't help. Maybe if I... Ah, that's... <laughs> there we go. That's better. 
All right. Now, in terms of protecting the kidneys, uh, pursuant to that question, uh, again, you want to, the best way to protect your kidneys from damage is to have optimized blood sugar control. Optimized blood pressure control is also very important. Now, one question here, and again, we're <laughs> I don't know. Emily, does it matter that we've gotten off track with our theme of uh, preparing for your diabetes focus visit? You can let me know if you think that's a concern. Not. Nah. Emily says, no. All right. Well, she's the boss. So uh, the question here is, my endocrinologist wants me to wait until I'm finished having children before I look at using statin medication. And again, statins are drugs for cholesterol reduction, but often used, even if your cholesterol is excellent, to prevent heart attack or stroke in people at high risk. Uh, so, should you take a statin medication if you're pregnant? No, you should not. Should you take an ACE inhibitor or ARB if you're pregnant? No, you should not. However, if you're not planning on getting pregnant, if you're using effective contraception and using it religiously, and therefore not at risk of getting pregnant, and if your cholesterol is poor, then it's perfectly fine to take statin medication at that time. And at, at some future point, if you're looking at conceiving and looking at withdrawing contraception, then the statin medication should be withdrawn, or the ACE inhibitor or ARB, in advance of withdrawing contraception. Stop those medications, and then you can safely get pregnant. So really, it, it depends. I mean, if you're planning on looking at conceiving six months from now, there's no point starting a statin or other drugs like ACE inhibitors, etc., because six months of protection from those drugs over the entirety of your life is really a very small amount of time. But I've got many patients of childbearing age who are taking statin medications and want to get pregnant. And when the time comes that they're ready to try to conceive, I'll stop those medications. Then, after they've been off the medication for a few weeks, they will then withdraw contraception. And if their blood sugar control is optimal, they can then look at uh, conceiving. Do I have advice about white coat hypertension? Well, yes, absolutely. I have advice about a lot of things. Um, just ask my kids. So yes, if you have your blood pressure checked when you see a doctor, usually not a nurse, it's usually the doctors, we're guilty, um, and your blood pressure is high, that may just be from the, it's called white coat hypertension, even though most doctors don't wear white coats anymore. Uh, so it may just be your blood pressure is transiently high due to the stress of being in the doctor's office. So if I suspect that's the case, what I'll recommend to a patient, and for those of you that are my patients that are watching, you'll recognize this advice, so if I think the problem may just be that I'm the one responsible for your high blood pressure, then I would recommend you get your blood pressure checked at the pharmacy. Most pharmacies have blood pressure machines, and some, and I quite like this, some even have printouts that you can tear off and bring to your doctor. So get your blood pressure checked in a more real-world real setting. Get it checked at a drugstore or buy your own machine. They're quite affordable these days, and most are quite accurate. Don't get the type that goes over a finger. Those aren't. Don't get the type over a wrist. I don't like those. Get the type that goes over your arm. Write down your readings. And then bring your blood pressure machine and your readings with you when you go to see your doctor. Number one, the readings will be important for them to look at. And number two, they can have you check your blood pressure yourself. And then shortly thereafter, within a minute or two, they can check your blood pressure using their own machine and make sure that they are comparable. They should be very similar. And there's a number of patients I see that I think have hypertension, but when they actually get their blood pressure checked using a reliable instrument elsewhere, it's normal. And that's really helpful because there are patients, therefore, that typically don't need blood pressure medication. The other thing you could do, by the way, um, a lot of doctors, well, I say a lot, many doctors have ambulatory blood pressure machines that you wear for 24 hours and they'll record your blood pressure every hour. And then after 24 hours, the data is downloaded so we can get a better sense of what your blood pressure is like in a real, real, <laughs> real world setting. I'm getting tired. All right, here's another question. Um, 
What if you're not bothered by sharps, but your partner is? I'm thinking of the emergency glucagon scenario. Right. Well, I think that's, that's a, a good question. I don't think it's off the wall, actually. So the question, therefore, is you're prone to severe low blood sugar. You might become unconscious because of it. You know that this glucagon emergency kit is available and can be administered to you, but the person who would do so is hesitant to because the idea of them injecting this medication, and it's got a needle at the end, intimidates them or scares them, frightens them, etc. That's understandable. And there are some people that even though they know it's something they should do, just can't bring themselves to do it. Well, that's human nature. So just call 911. If you live in a, in, in, a, in a place where a paramedic can get to you in timely fashion within a few minutes, 10, 15 minutes, even somewhat longer, then almost always when they arrive, they can quickly give you glucagon or intravenous glucose and resuscitate you and you'll be fine. The one exception to that situation, I've got a number of patients that like to go camping in the wilderness or they go skidooing, uh, snowmobiling out in the wilderness or hiking or mountain climbing or whatever. And I don't know too many paramedics that can get to the middle of a forest in Ontario in 15 minutes. So in that situation, wherever you are in the world, if you are going to be traveling to places where a paramedic couldn't get to you in timely fashion and you're on insulin, then I would recommend that you take a glucagon kit with you and make sure that at least one of the people you're with feels comfortable that they could do it in an emergency situation. And you can show them, you know, what be required, and hopefully they'll feel comfortable doing so. So that situation is really uh, essential. But I've got a whole bunch of patients where family members love them, care for them, want to help them out, but just can't bring themselves to give glucagon. And, you know, I'm not judging. That makes sense. I think there are some people it's just such a difficult thing to do, especially when you see a loved one unconscious on the floor. What a terrible situation. So, again, in that situation, just dial 911. Paramedic will get there and help you out. How can we increase our HDL? Wow, Emily, we're really off track, eh? Not that that matters. I'm happy to do this. Um, so how can we increase our HDL? That's really tough. So we know the HDL is the good cholesterol. It stands for high-density lipoprotein, but just think of H for healthy. The bad one is called LDL, or low-density lipoprotein. Think L for lousy. You want your LDL to be low. You want your HDL to be high. Getting your LDL low is pretty easy these days. Good blood sugar control helps and exercise helps and so forth. But statin medications, many of you are probably on Crestor or Lipitor or Pravacol, the Zocor, there's a whole bunch of drugs. Um, they're really effective at lowering the LDL. Raising the HDL is much trickier. So avoiding excess alcohol helps. Making sure you're, you're at appropriate weight helps. Exercise helps. Many drugs have been developed or are in the process of being developed to help raise HDL, but we don't yet have safe, effective drugs to do so. There's still many in the pipeline. Many are being looked at, but there aren't good pharmacological drug ways of helping. So it's really more lifestyle measures to raise HDL cholesterol. All right. I see Emily's writing me a note. I'm going to have to scroll down to better be able to see it here. Okay, I had a high potassium problem, and we canceled the ramipril. So ramipril is an ACE inhibitor medication. Um, do I understand a regular yearly blood test should be performed to check potassium? Okay, so let me talk about that in broad strokes. So ACE inhibitors, they've been around forever in a day since I was an intern, and that was during Neanderthal times. Uh, ACE inhibitors have been around forever. Very effective drugs, very safe, very potent, as are ARB medications. Most people, not all, most people with diabetes should be on one of those medications. Again, not all. You have to talk to your healthcare team to see if you should be. 
Virtually every medication has the potential for adverse effects, including ACE inhibitors like Ramipril or ARBs. But generally speaking, they're very safe, well-tolerated, and don't cause problems. However, as this person is asking about, they can cause potassium retention. If that's mild, it's no big deal. But if it's more severe, it can lead to high potassium levels in the blood. Again, a very mild, no big deal. But if you have kidney malfunction, in particular if you have kidney failure, the potassium level can go up very high and actually be dangerous to the point of being life-threatening. Seldom, seldom, seldom happens, but it can. The only way of knowing your potassium level is high is on a blood test. You won't feel different. So, if your potassium is high on a blood test, and if you're on an ACE inhibitor like Ramipril or any of the others, or an ARB, there's a few things that can be done. If the problem is mild, then your nutritionist or your other members of your healthcare team can give you information on how to avoid potassium in your diet. Or you can find that on the internet. Make sure you're going to a good website and look up what foods are rich in potassium and you can avoid those. The other thing is that the dose of the medication, the ACE inhibitor, like Ramipril or AB, could be reduced. Sometimes though, your potassium level is high enough and your kidney malfunction is severe enough that's exacerbating the potassium problem that your Ramipril or other drugs like that need to be discontinued. But that's pretty rare. Unless someone has quite severe kidney malfunction, and in particular kidney failure, it's pretty rare that those drugs, ACE inhibitors, uh, etc., need to be withdrawn because of high potassium levels. Sometimes I'll stop them temporarily until the effect of a um, until the effect of the uh, medication, the other medication responsible, has worn off, and then I might reintroduce the medication in a low dose. All right, and then I was asked about drugs that can interfere with blood glucose readings. So there aren't many and uh, drugs that can interfere, and um, but it, it's mostly there are some drugs prescription or non-prescription, then it can interfere with the way in which blood glucose values are measured using finger stick testing. Finger stick testing uses a reagent called glucose oxidase. Anyways, that process can be interfered with by some medication. But it, that, that is seldom an issue to the point that it will actually cause your blood sugar readings to be so inaccurate that they're unreliable. You know, I don't have the, the uh, uh, time right now to go through all the different medications and how they do that and their degree of impact, but suffice to say that it's seldom what we call a clinically significant issue. But if you look up online, again, go to a reputable website, not Sam's Barbershop and Diabetes Emporium. Uh, go to the ADA website or CDA or in the UK the diabetes organization there, and you can find more information on that. Or alternatively, by the way, you could go to the uh, websites of the companies that make the meters, um, and they would have information typically there as well. They may sign, ask you to sign a disclaimer, you know, signing your firstborn away uh, in order to access that information, but it should be uh, fairly readily available. All right, so Emily, it looks like we've addressed all the questions, and oh my goodness, I've been speaking for 53 minutes. I wonder if my headset is going to die very soon. So far, it's held up. Um, so I'm going to sign off. Thanks for uh, watching. It was fun doing this, and I really appreciate you sending in your questions. Uh, that uh, uh, reassured me there actually are people out there that are, uh, that are here chatting with me. So uh, best wishes uh, on great success managing your diabetes. Be prepared when you see your doctor. Go through the different things we chatted about today. Go to reliable websites and stay well. Goodbye.